Thank you very much, Mark, for that uh, very kind uh, uh, introduction. Um, I'd like, first of all, uh, to begin by saying that, that I do not consider myself an expert. This is not uh, an awkward attempt to, to score some points since the very beginning, some points of sympathy, but simply because this does not reflect the reality for two reasons. First, out of respect for the real experts on Afghanistan and the region, uh, with whom I had the pleasure, the honor, and also the privilege to work recently, particularly within Afghanistan. And second, because what I'd like to do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so uh, is to um, essentially walk together through the complexities of uh, a regional security context, such as Central Asia, intended in the broader sense, because that's the context where uh, NATO is conducting, uh, is uh, pursuing its process of adaptation to the new uh, so-called 21st century uh, security challenges. And one thing we need to keep in mind is humility. The expertise, as also extrapolated from the wonderful remarks made by the previous panel, is something that is built on a daily basis. And it will take a lot of time before we can really proclaim to be all experts on Afghanistan. With that said, I'd like to cover essentially three issues. First, I'd like to start by providing a very, very uh, quick explanation on what are the core tasks of NATO, because I think it's important to talk about the engagement of NATO in the broader um, uh, Central Asian uh, regional security context if we have first in mind what NATO is, what kind of institution NATO is, and what NATO is not. Then i like to cover what I call the challenges that on a daily basis this political military institution faces in Afghanistan and also in other countries uh, with whom we are developing close relationships, particularly Pakistan and all the Central Asian partners. And then um, give you some conclusive remarks for what I think, from a NATO perspective, is the political military added value that NATO can still bring in uh, at the table. First of all, what NATO is and what NATO is not. This is an intergovernmental consensus-driven organization which essentially carries out four tasks. It is a forum of consultation on issues of mutual concern among uh, North European and among uh, uh, North American and European allies. Secondly, is the embodiment of the preservation of the transatlantic link. That embodiment which is enshrined in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which for the irony of history was actually invoked for the first time on 12 September 2001. That is, an attack against one member is an attack against us all, and therefore it triggers the conditions to re-establish the situation that existed before that attack occurred. Thirdly, and more so presently, it is a player in crisis management uh, uh, situation. It's a player devoted to pursue a specific mandate, and that mandate is to provide security. That's what NATO primarily and ultimately is, a provider of security. And finally, as I also will try to explain in my uh, conclusive remarks, NATO is more and more a framework to develop partnerships with an increasing number of actors, ranging from Australia to Pakistan to Sweden, Finland, and more recently even South Korea, which irrespective of their uh, willingness one day to further formalize the relationship with NATO, share specific security interests, and therefore see an added value in cooperating on specific areas of interest with this organization. These core tasks are what NATO is. These are the DNA of the alliance. So the question that, uh, upon which I would like to base uh, the next series of remarks is how NATO is changing the way it delivers security in a new globalized security context. The reason why I'm saying this is because whereas in a Cold War we could use the equation security equals military defense, this equation doesn't stand anymore. Security is a much, much, much broader concept which requires still a political military player deeply involved within it. So NATO has to be seen as one of several players that operate together. It's therefore 
the, the quintessential challenge for NATO, as I'll try to explain now in more details in Afghanistan and Central Asia, is how this organization joins itself up with other security actors, which may not have a military expertise, but nevertheless have something to bring, to bring at the table, because as I said, security is just more than military hardware. Now, second point, the Afghanistan context which represents the top priority of the alliance, is, to put it mildly, the most visible litmus test on how NATO is adapting itself to uh, a new globalized security environment. And I'd like to now uh, walk with you through what I think are seven primary challenges that also on the basis of my humble and personal experience on the ground, I think, need to be taken into account. The first, overarching challenge is that Afghanistan is a context with respect to which NATO in its own history is for the very first time involved in a counterinsurgency campaign. To put it mildly, Afghanistan is a context with respect to which NATO, with huge political solidarity driven by consensus, engage without having any institutional knowledge whatsoever. And that institutional knowledge continues to be built on a daily basis. Now, this primary and underpinning challenge uh, triggers a variety of other challenges that I would like to articulate uh, more thoroughly. The first, which I think perhaps may be of more immediate impact or immediate relevance for a political military organization is what kind of military posture, what kind of military mindset we can uh, adopt, we can exert, we can carry out in Afghanistan. And that is the approach of General McChrystal, with respect to which some actually um, pretty uh, um, exhaustive reference was made before, but which perhaps I think it's important to summarize. The McChrystal approach, the commander of ISAF approach, is based on three main points. Why do we need a robust military footprint in Afghanistan? To do essentially three things. First, to put the population at the center of gravity of the mission. It is not primarily from a military point of view about killing the so-called bad guys, although through a nuanced military approach, those guys need to be pursued militarily. It's about creating the condition to diminish the level of proximity between the insurgencies and the population, because that is the added value of the insurgency on the ground. Second is to support indigenous forces. In a traditional counterinsurgency campaign, the so-called winds and minds of the population, an expression which I personally do not want to use too much, but basically the support of the local population has to be based primarily on a sensation by the population that the people looking after themselves, the people in charge of creating the conditions to make their life more secure, are national and accountable security forces with support from international troops. And third, counterinsurgency means also that the military instrument has to be synced up, meaning has to be carried out in full coordination with other predominantly civilian stabilization efforts, which we call, with an extreme simplification, consolidation of good governance, and social and economic development. And, and let me simply add that the critical, the key driver is governance, because until you have a governance vacuum, no military uplift alone will solve the problem. So the first challenge is to essentially roll out a counterinsurgency campaign that, frankly speaking, NATO has never been tested to experience throughout its own history, because let's face it, NATO has been involved in high-intensity uh, operations, but the, the highest-intensity operation before Afghanistan was uh, Operational Light Force, the air campaign to create the conditions to liberate Kosovo. After that, NATO has been involved at the maximum to robust peacekeeping in the Balkan region, but never involved in a land-based counterinsurgency operation. The second important uh, challenge that we face on the ground is the perception of the, the military by the local population. In a variety of senses, 
uh, how the population feels protected by the military, but also how the population sees the military creating the conditions to make their life better. Which means that from an operational point of view, the military on the ground have to be strike on a daily basis a balance, a balance between stay, as we say in an awful military jargon, within their own lane, which is provide security, and act as gap fillers. Because the actors that are supposed to provide governance and development in the eyes of the population, whether that perception is true or not, it's not for me to judge, don't see them a presence and therefore ask the military to provide more than what the mandate, the know-how and the expertise of the military can provide. The third challenge is what the previous panelists refer uh, previously, either explicitly or between the lines. Support to Afghan ownership. We are there because this is in our security interest and we are there upon a request for assistance by the Afghan authorities and on the basis of a mandate provided by the United Nations Security Council. Which basically means that we are there to support, since the very beginning, a process which has to be seen, has to be analyzed and has to be perceived by the population as literally and de facto run by the Afghan authorities. But what it means to support Afghan ownership. Well, it certainly has a military implications. We need to make sure that the Afghan national security forces are more and more up to the job, are put in conditions to uh, exert their security responsibilities. I can give you an example. The operation in Marja described before has been characterized by very encouraging development from a purely military point of view. Before Marja, the ratio of the international versus national security forces was 10 to 1. In Marja, it has been reduced down to 2 to 1. Does this mean that the forces are so sustainable? Absolutely not, and I can only stress what the previous panelist was saying. But it means that we are on the right track to develop a sense of security ownership by the Afghans. But Afghan ownership means also ownership by the Afghans to look after the governance and the development needs of the population. And there are some indicators in this respect that uh, um, we can quote. A uh, number of schools uh, built, uh, um, kilometers of roads uh, rehabilitated, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, this means a perception by the Afghans that the Afghan authorities are accountable to the local population, because at the end of the day, that, what, that is what matters. So a challenge, the primary and ultimate challenge to support Afghan ownership means making the Afghan authorities understand that ownership also means undertaking political responsibilities, making commitments that uh, fundamental services will be delivered. The good news is that President Karzai has made those commitments in the inaugural speech and at the London uh, conference in uh, end of January of this year. Now the proof is in the pudding. He will have to uphold commitments that he has taken politically. The fourth important challenge is what we call the support to the comprehensive approach. NATO is a security provider, and we all understand that no matter how you want to put it, there is no way to create a difference in Afghanistan without a proper security framework. Now, whether July 2011 deadline is a drawdown or a reconfiguration of the military posture is not relevant, I think, for the essence of the debate in this part of the conference proceedings. What matters, I think, is a clear-cut message that we will need a military presence, an international military presence, for quite some time down the road. But NATO does not have the answer to all the problems that exist in Afghanistan. And that's why I think it's important also to recognize the centrality of the partnership between NATO and other international organizations, including the United Nations. Now, one of the indicators of progress I think, in Afghanistan, even from a purely atmospheric or optical point of view, beyond the strategy of Commander McChrystal, is a really solid partnership being developed 
between the international community and the Afghan government, but also within the international community among three key figures. Komaisov, responsible to deliver security. The Afghan NATO senior civilian representative, who does not have the mandate to coordinate the civilian activities of the international community, but rather the goal to make sure that the military efforts are synced up with the, the civilian stabilization efforts. And the special envoy of the United Nations Secretary General for Afghanistan, Mr. Staffan de Mistura, who has a mandate from the UN Security Council to coordinate the overall international um, um, civilian uh, assistance efforts. But I think there are two final challenges on which we, and, and when I mean we, I mean our Afghan interlocutors as well as NATO, as well as many other actors of international communities are going to be challenged. How capable we are to re-engage the Afghan population in the Afghan political process. I like to quote, or at least I hope that I will do it in, in, an effect, in a reasonably effective way, what Ambassador Sedgwick, the current NATO civilian representative, senior civilian representative of Afghanistan, said in a recent speech delivered in London. One of the most important indicator of progress in Afghanistan is that sometime down the road the integrity of the Afghan nation will be assured. Because without an integrity of the Afghan nation, without participation, with, without the buy-in of the Afghan nation, there will not be durable security. And the final challenge that we continue to face, and we, which was also mentioned before, is to give the following signal to the Afghans. We are there to support your elected rulers to deliver on their sovereign responsibility. And that's why transition is so important. But we will remain until you ask us, and in any case, until the job is finished. Because let's face it, the Afghans feel, and that is something brought to our attention on a daily basis, that the international community will once again abandon them. A very final challenge, and now we enter into the neighboring countries of Afghanistan, has to do with the NATO engagement in the regional context. One, I think, of the shortfalls was, as mentioned before, to not to have adequately resourced the mission. And let's be frank, we are not there yet, despite the military uplift, despite the provision of the trainers um, that are required to build up the Afghan National Security Forces, the current Secretary General, as well as actually the previous NATO leadership, continue to pound on the head of the NATO permanent representatives that we need to send more trainers because that's the cornerstone of our exit strategy. But, uh, Another, I think, shortfall has been to recognize that Afghanistan must be put into the proper regional context. And that's where our engagement with the neighboring countries, particularly Pakistan, but also Central Asian partners, is extremely important. There, I see two main challenges. The first is what I call an Afghan-centric challenge. The other is a challenge in our relationship with these countries that goes beyond the prism of Afghanistan. From the point of view of our engagement in Afghanistan, we need to send the following signal to the neighboring countries, that NATO will remain in Afghanistan until the job is finished. Why? Because we have ultimately an obligation not to take shortcuts, but rather to create the conditions so that once we really are de facto redeployed, the people on the ground, and this includes Afghans, but also regional actors, will not be asked to put up with a mess that may have been left should the redeployment have occurred before mature conditions occur. But the second challenge, which is the one that goes beyond the Afghan prism, is because this country, and legitimately, don't want to be engaged by an organization called North Atlantic Treaty Organization exclusively through the prism of Afghanistan. That's why it's important to bring them into the equation, but also to explain to them that because of the characterization of NATO, they can also cooperate with NATO on other issues that may find of common interest beyond Afghanistan. 
the ultimate decision, of course, is up to this country, because NATO does not want to play the role of a sort of global policeman. But what I think is our responsibility is to continue explaining to these nations what is the specific added value that they can draw from cooperating with us. And I see essentially three points, and with this I conclude. NATO brings to the table one fundamental political added value, which no coalition of the, of the willing whatsoever can guarantee. And that is political solidarity that only decision by consensus can produce, and implementation of those decisions through an integrated military structure accountable to civilian authorities sitting in the North Atlantic Council. Secondly, the centrality of the partnership between NATO and the United Nations should not be underestimated. The United Nations remains the leading agency to preserve international peace and security. There is no aspiration whatsoever from NATO to supplement the United Nations. But thirdly, NATO has to be seen as a globe, as an institution actively engaged in a globalized security context, which doesn't mean that NATO wants to go global. It means that NATO is one of several players that have to be interact among themselves within what I call a still unfolding multilateral security network of players. And with this, I'd like to thank Mr. Chairman for the opportunity and uh, uh, thank you all for your kind attention and I'll be happy to take any question you have or listen to any comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ipia. Who would like to ask the first question? Maybe my colleague will assist with the microphone. And uh, again, let's try to get some new voices. Maybe let's start off to the side and then we can move to the left. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Lopez from Mexico. Hi. I have two quick questions. Uh, one, you keep mentioning the Afghan nation, but in the morning you were assured such thing does not exist and that they are organized rather by tribal groupings and different uh, than our, the societies we know. And the second one, uh, the uh, United States uh, representatives mentioned earlier that in the new strategy, Pakistan will now consider, along with Afghanistan as a whole, is this the case for NATO as well? And what does this imply? And does this fit into the UN resolution? Okay, if we take a few together. Sure, but, uh, I mean, let's maybe take uh, at least one or two others. Uh, maybe from this side of the room this time, towards the back. I see there's a hand to the left. And then we'll come back to the right. Okay. All right, yeah. Um, Sorry to direct this question at you, I'm going to probably direct it to anyone this morning that we've had. Um, because mainly, obviously, NATO deals with hard power and security, etc. Um, but we're obviously here, it says on that board, International Symposium on Cultural Diplomacy. Um, I'd just like to ask you about the role of soft power, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I don't fully buy the idea that just because you know there's a state of conflict there, that there's no, there's no uh, opportunity for, for the role of soft power. You know, just because people are, are fighting, you know, Afghans still have their daily lives, they still trade with each other, they still go to the shops, do their daily things. Uh, and there is a role for, there is pockets of areas there with a role for, for soft power. Um, and we had our first speaker from NATO uh, this morning said NATO deals with security in the widest sense. Um, and I really think there's a role for soft power and cultural di diplomacy in creating security, uh, not just military means. Um, particularly in Afghanistan, um, where the nation is so segmented, so uh, decentralized with various ethnic and tribal groups, um, and uh, bringing those together and occupying the youth to you know, stop them going over to the Taliban. What potential do you see for, uh, for a role for soft power and cultural diplomacy, and is this something NATO uh, is dealing with? Thanks. Since you're taking notes, maybe we'll take one more question. Is that okay? I don't want to give too many at once, but uh, I think I have some question. <laughs> there, maybe the gentleman who's raising his hand. I don't think he's been able to speak yet. Uh, Alexander Koska, I'm, come from, I'm coming from Poland. That's a quote from uh, Foreign Affairs. A local defense initiative, a new program that supports village level community police by providing training, radios, and uniforms. How it is related to supporting centralized uh, uh, 
know, centralized secu security networks, because this is not centralized, this is decentralized. How is it related to each other? Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, um, I'll start with the, obviously with the first questions. Well, the Afghan nation, uh, you hold there. The Afghan nation has uh, a set of different groupings, ethnic groupings, tribal groupings, and intra-tribal groupings exist. It has been destructed throughout all these years for a variety of reasons, last but not least, because I think a lack of real commitment to tackle the culture of impunity. That's why the upcoming Cons uh, um, consultative peace Jilga is an opportunity to re-engage all these groupings and give them a say on an important issue such as reintegration or reconciliation. According to the information that we have available, we're talking about between 1,400 and 1,600 people of different categories, ethnical and tribal, uh, that are supposed to participate in the Loya Jilga. Therefore, the political calendar represented by the Peace Jirka and also the 18th September parliamentary election should be seen, in my opinion, as an opportunity to lay the foundation and to bring these groupings together and give them an opportunity to have a say in the political, in the political process. Um, when we talk about uh, the need to spend time to reach out to the people, so that we have the support from them necessary to hold the territory and create the condition to improve governance and development is because the people feel disconnected. The good news is that the central authorities is actively engaged. But one thing is to say, I am actively engaged. Another thing is to expect that because you show your face for the first time after a long time, the people will support you immediately. This uh, uh, um, outreach has to be a constant effort. Pakistan. With Pakistan, NATO has what we call the Tailored Cooperation Program, which has three dimensions. A practical to, which is essentially military to military cooperation, a political dialogue dimension, and a public diplomacy dimension. The military to military dimension is best explained through the activities of what we call the Tripartite Commission. Afghans, Pakistanis, and ISAF officers sitting together and share as much information as possible in order to build confidence and provide a better baseline to cooperate further to diminish or essentially to restrict the marginal maneuver of the insurgents crossing the borders. The political dialogue actually has already been launched. General Kiani approached and um, briefed the military committee. Prime Minister Ghilani is expected soon to brief the NAC. And uh, last week, actually, the Special Envoy of the Secretary General of NATO for Caucasus and Central Asia, U.S. Ambassador Simmons, conducted in Islamabad uh, the first high-level talks of NATO. Although the, the UN, uh, and to be fully honest with you, the very, very first engagement made by the NATO leadership with the Pakistani authorities was done by the former Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Ambassador Mutorizzo, who I have the honor to, uh, uh, to see here today. The message coming from the Pakistanis has been clear. It's in our interest to see a stable Afghanistan. But the additional message has been we are also ready to pursue other areas of interest. That said, and that's the third dimension, the Pakistanis, and I think legitimately, are very, very adamant on the need to explain systematically to the Pakistani public opinion what NATO really is. And I think we have some convincing arguments. NATO was asked by the Pakistanis to assist them in a humanitarian crisis uh, caused by the earthquake in October 2005. But that being said, there are some uh, uh, perceptions that we may like, we may not like, but we have to have the decency, the political commitment, and the humility to address. And that's what the public diplomacy outreach is all about. Final question. There is a need to address security at the sub-national level. And the Afghan National Police Strategy envisages several pillars of the Afghan National Police, one of which is, is the Afghan Public Protection Force, which is extremely localized, but which nevertheless is a, 
unit of the police ultimately accountable to the Ministry of Interior. The question, I think, is not only to make sure that there is a clear command and control responsibility between the localized police units and the Ministry of Interior. The importance is that we bring more clarity at the subnational level to what the institutional, military and civilian responsibilities are. And a good development in that respect is represented by the approval of the subnational governance policy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Daniele Riggio, thank you very, very much.